Hello, I'm Dr. Darlene Chambers, Senior Vice President for Programs and Services with the National Charter Schools Institute. Thanks for joining me today. We're starting our time together with a question. The same question we'll end with. How does a quality authorizer develop or perhaps refine what you have as a charter school application review process to ensure that the review rubric is in alignment with the application criteria, is consistent and fair. It's about your rubric. It's about how you put your new school charters, uh, new charter school application together, the criteria, and are those consistent and fair with each other? Let's get started. Wisconsin has an authorizer charter school model application process. You can find it on the WORKS website at the CESA 9. Uh, it's an excellent resource, but I'm going to hit the highlights of it right now. Pursuant to the Wisconsin State Statute 118.40, this model application process guides authorizers to develop their own application template. Feel free to customize. Feel free to, to make sure that it is dovetailing in alignment with who you are as an authorizer. Provides suggested steps to solicit proposals for high quality charter schools. Do you advertise to the general public that they can apply to start a new school or perhaps expand their existing charter school. That solicitation and advertisement is important. You get to choose the method and how you're going to do it. Provides model procedures for evaluating and approving successful applicants and denying unsuccessful ones. This should be a very transparent process where everybody's clear how do I throw my hat in the ring? How am I going to be judged? How are decisions going to be made? Who's going to make those decisions? What kind of timeline do I have to pay attention to? The whole process is important. The model application evaluation framework is also found in that guidance resource that I mentioned. It, it, it contains a written application evaluation for you to consider. Applicant capacity interview is suggested and discussed. Solicitation of public input. They even talk about public hearings or requests for written testimony that you might want to consider for your application practice and process. An authorizer written recommendation to the authorizer board is another guidance piece. And they give you an example of that again. The Wisconsin Authorizer Model Application process that can be located in the guidebook as a resource on the WORKS website. Let's delve into, jump into the two parts of a model application suggested for Wisconsin for authorizers. I like part A, pretty easy. It's the technical requirements. The information collected are identifying data. How do I find you? Who's in charge? Who's the lead on the application? The contacts, very important that for school leader and board members. Purpose and brief history of the organization. Incorporating evidence. What type of incorporation do you have? And the evidence that you have that. Any anticipated school operation subcontracts. Uh, educational service providers. A uh, yellow bus contract, uh, perhaps food service, evidence of incorporation, and that's required for contract execution. So important that you have it up front. Those are pretty black and white issues, uh, data that the authorizer is going to collect in Part A. So how do they use a rubric to take a measurement on this? Well, it's either included or it's not included. So those six items that I mentioned literally have a toggle switch. 
Did you include them? I hope so. That means you get a check mark. And who's going to make these decisions? Typically, most often it's the internal authorizer uh, office that reviews it prior to submission of Part B. It's not usually a huge committee or an external reviewer that's part of this. Uh, this is pretty simple. But if anything is forgotten, not a good idea. You're not going to pass go if you don't have some of those items mentioned. So make sure you include them. Part B is what I call substantive requirements in the model application rubric. It includes the identifying information, the mission vision statement. I hope that equity is always uh, addressed and introduced in the application. Charter schools are about innovation and about focusing on increasing best practices. So what is the application going to say about that? And is your rubric going to have that as a criteria? Serving special populations is important. And school program description. There's more. What are the special characteristics of the applied school, the school that's trying to be considered or replicated? School philosophy in alignment with curriculum instructions and strategies, curricular and instructional strategies, methodology to improve educational outcomes. You deliver what you measure. So how are you going to deliver those measurements, those metrics that are so critical on behalf of the students to have quality education? And by the way, the charter is with the governing board. So who's the pro proposed governance of the new school startup or an expanded or um, perhaps replicated high performing school? Financial capacity, incredibly important. How are you going to do what you said you're going to do? What's the money behind it? What's the sustainable financial capacity? Potential location, where's your school going to be? Community support evidence. Have you gone out in the community and done surveys? Have you talked to the community? Can you tell me why you believe the community can benefit from this application and this new school? The business plan, very, very critical when you have a new school startup, an innovative idea, an entrepreneurial idea. Even if you're going for more money or you're trying to get people to donate to your school, you better have that business plan. And it is required in the application that we suggest. The model rubric for charter school application is the scoring boxes, helps you understand what are you gonna do with that above criteria we just talked about? How are you going to know that it will deliver the quality education that the applicant is hoping for. The model charter school application has a good, solid, basic rubric to consider. Locate that resource, check out the rubric. I'm going to hit the highlights for you. The rubric guides authorizers and reviewers through assessment of key elements. Keep asking yourself, essential key elements that will be needed to design, manage, and operate a quality charter school. Each section, each rubric section should restate the application request and provides evaluative criteria. So we requested a business plan. Is there a rubric a section that you can measure that business plan. Otherwise, why'd you ask for the business plan? The rubric suggested by Wisconsin determines if the applicant response meets, partially meets, or does not meet. Now you get to decide the language in your rubric. We trust your judgment again. 
but this is the simple language that's recommended in Wisconsin on your charter school application guide. Don't forget the summary notes. When you make judgment on a rubric, let's say you give it a score of partially meets, but there's no notes. And I'm looking at the decision, and perhaps you published it or you gave it to the applicant, and they're very curious, well, why do they think I partially meet it, but I don't totally meet the criteria of the business plan, our example. The summary notes are gonna clarify and give evidence of why the scorer, why did you say that there's something missing and this will help the applicant. The rubric, rubric overall decision suggested by Wisconsin is approve, approve with revisions or deny. Again, make sure that you have summary comments on why you made any one of the decisions of approve, approve with revisions or deny, so that the applicant and the public can be well informed and they can understand the judgment you made, the decisions that you came up with. The summary comments also really help focus on key strengths and concerns as applicable. So yes, Making a score of meets, partially meets, does not meet. Overall decision of approve, approve with revisions and deny are important, key, but it is also equally as important. I'm strongly suggesting that your reviewers have comments. I put together an application rubric review checklist just for all of you in the state of Wisconsin. We will be providing this list in a separate guide. You can use it as a self audit of your rubric that you already have for consistency, fairness, and complete, completeness. Or you can use it, put it right beside you on the desk as you develop uh, your first application review rubric. What is the checklist and what are the elements of the checklist? You will be asked to find evidence for the application requirements. How are they associated with the evaluation criteria? Otherwise, if there's evaluation criteria but you didn't have them as a requirement, how can you judge it if the applicant didn't know they needed to include the data or needed to include the information? So as you develop your application criteria requirements, make sure that you have uh, the ability to score whether or not it's included. The rubric includes only elements necessary to evaluate quality. Make sure that what you're asking for really determines that the school is ready, fiscally, academically, and operationally to swing open its doors. The criteria address the standard and specific information required to meet the standard. So in your rubric and on the sample Wisconsin application uh, model guide, you'll see samples of meets and it lists out how I can, as a reviewer, check that box. What determines meets? What determines partially meets on that particular standard? Let's stay with our business plan. And what does not meet? And in that rubric, have a description of how to get check marks in which one of those boxes as a reviewer. The rubric drives the reviewer to score but it also drives the reviewer to list those strengths and weaknesses always based on evidence and facts and not on personal preference. I highly recommend, I'm hopeful, that you consider a capacity interview. Because in the world of a new school startup or a replication expansion, it's all about does the entity, does the applicant, does the group have the capacity 
to open that school door with quality. From day one, I hope. The capacity interview questions generated are through the rubric scoring and comments. See, there's comments. There's written thoughts of why you judged and how you judged what you did in the scoring really inform the capacity interview. What needs to be amplified one-on-one -on -one with this group? And what do you need to know more about that you couldn't extract from the application? Perfect questions during the capacity interview. It is about gaining more information wherever it's lacking clarity. That's why I go to that written response. It's a feed-in. Considering NAXA again, the National Association of Charter School Authorizers, authorizing practices, they have reviewed many, many, many application processes across the country of members and non-members. And here are some weaknesses that they found that they suggest you avoid. They found the key weakness was not aligning the rubric to the authorizer's performance frameworks. What are the expectation of your authorizer office for academics? What are the metrics that you're looking for to show financial sustainability? What kind of operations expectations do you have listed in your contract in your performance framework? You also must align the application criteria and rubric. Remember the list in part B of all the particular criteria? We amplified the business plan. If you're going to ask for it, then it needs to be measured and it needs to be in the rubric. The rubric should cover, if it does not, it's a weakness, all required application documents. I don't know about you, but if I'm an applicant and somebody asks me for some evidence or information or data, and I don't see that they measured it, I'm wondering why I didn't get credit for it. Not making it available, again, I always strongly suggest to make your process as transparent as possible. And please, I've said it once, I've said it twice, and I'm going to say it again. Provide written evaluation summaries of why the measurements were uh, chosen, meet, partially meets, does not meet, approve or denied. Needs to have an evaluation summary with it. Let's end our time together as we began. How does a quality authorizer develop or refine a charter school application review process to ensure the rubric is in alignment with the application criteria, that it's consistent and fair? I hope your walk away is being able to answer that question, that your outcome is you will be able to develop your own application rubric and measurement process, and that it's transparent, consistent, and fair. If you already have one, how about continuous improvement or thinking about refinement? I'm lucky to have you with me today. Thanks for joining me.